And it is my pleasure to introduce Veronica Gutierrez. She is an associate professor of Latin American history and director of undergraduate research at Azusa Pacific University. She is an expert on colonial Mexico, Mesoamerica, and the early Catholic, early modern Catholic world. She's the author of Converting the Sacred City, Franciscans, Nahuas, and Spaniards. Today she will speak to us about a actually a topic that I have been dying to hear since I first got an email from uh, uh, Philip like six months ago. <laughs> I'm a Luther scholar, so I'm, I'm like ridiculously excited to hear this lecture. <laughs> Luther in the New World, Native People and the Reformation in 16th century New Spain. Thank you, David. <clears throat> thank you all for joining me today. I wanted to especially thank Philip for his invitation. Um, some of you may know that um, Philip and I go way back. I met him when I was at Penn State doing an MFA in creative nonfiction. I took a history course with him. He recommended me to his history colleague who does Latin American history. And after taking courses with him, I decided to change the tra trajectory of my career and become a Latin American historian. So I really owe a lot to uh, Philip. And it's very nice to come back and see him um, and come and speak to you today. <clears throat> I thank um, Beth and all the others who also helped me um, some of you may have heard I, with whether I was diverted to Austin, I couldn't fly into Dallas, I had to end up renting a car. I got here at 10 o'clock at night and I have an eight month old baby with me. So, um, and my mother was supposed to join me but her flight was canceled. So I'm sort of on my own. So I'm very grateful for everyone who's pitched in and helped watch the baby sort of last minute. Um, <clears throat> so my talk, um, hopefully it lives up to um, David's expectations. <laughs> Uh, it is called Luther in the New World, Native People and Reformation in 16th Century New Spain. <coughs> Humidity, thick with the secrets of the past, held me in suspended animation. Eight months into my Fulbright year in Mexico, I found myself standing motionless in the town square of La Antigua, the first municipio or municipality established in main, the mainland New World. It was here on the shores of Veracruz on Good Friday, April 22nd, 1519, that Christianity arrived to Mexico at the point of a sword, clutched in the hand of Spanish conquistador Hernando Cortes. Indeed, before me rose La Ermita del Rosario, a modestly sized, brilliantly white chapel dedicated to Our Lady of the Rosary. Constructed in 1523, it remains the oldest operational Catholic church in Mexico. The oppressive heat and I were not alone. Two friends from Los Angeles had flown out to join me here on Mexico's sweltering Caribbean coast, the three of us intent upon tracing the route taken by Hernando Cortes as he advanced toward the Mexica and Tenochtitlan, capital of the Triple Alliance, more commonly known as the Aztec Empire, centered in what is today Mexico City. Fortuitously, we had arrived on April 21st, 2008, 489 years to the day that Cortes had himself drunk, dropped anchor in the natural harbor of San Juan de Olua on Maundy Thursday, traveling with 11 caravels carrying 16 horses, 550 men, and some small cannon. The port of San Juan de Olua near modern day Veracruz today houses a massive <coughs> complex of fortresses and prisons whose origins date to 1565. Visiting the previous afternoon on the anniversary of Cortez's arrival, my friends Steve, Martha, and I were surprised that none of the Mexican visitors knew the significance of the day. And that each time the guide questioned the crowd about the colonial past, it was I, an American historian in trading from UCLA, who provided the answer. Eager to escape the 90 degree tropical heat, we had lingered in the coolness of the gel cells the colonial era restraints still clinging to the dank interior. Gazing outward, we imagine the area in 1519 when it was populated by the Totonaco people who, upon witnessing the arrival of Cortez's fleet, had ventured out to the coast in greeting on Maundy Thursday and Good Friday. Easter Sunday, one of the most important feasts in the Christian calendar, would prove pivotal in the unfolding of empire and Christianity in the New World. <clears throat> After Fray Bartolomé de Almedo, a Mercedarian friar had chanted Easter Mass, 
Cortes dined with the indigenous Totonaco lords Tantil and Pipal Pitoque, emissaries sent by the powerful ruler Moctezuma, whose dominions extended to the coastal polities. Their scintillating dinner table conversation about Moctezuma's riches cemented Cortes's desire to advance inland toward Tenochtitlan, center of the imperialistic warrior Mexica people in modern day Mexico City. Cortes's goals would have been twofold. To bring Tenochtitlan under the jurisdiction of the Spanish king, Charles I, who would incidentally be appointed uh, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V in June of that year, and to spread Christianity. In fact, according to Spanish sources, Cortes gave an inspired speech during this meal, urging his companions not only to give up their idols and embrace the Christian God, but also to immediately cease providing tribute to Moctezuma. The previous day's heat in San Juan de Olua reached nearly intolerable proportions in La Antigua. And by late morning, we had exhausted our supply of water. Smothered by the steaminess of this place, my friend Martha, a native Colombiana, wandered off to purchase a chilled pineapple from a street vendor. Even as she pressed several cool slices into my hand, I remained transfixed in full sun, gazing at the central plaza. This place is like hell, she declared, breaking my reverie. Glancing to my right, I watched her brush perspiration from her nose, certain she meant to reference the weather, yet recognizing the ambivalence of her comment, which reflected early modern European reaction to this place as a land possessed by Satan. I'm not surprised Cortez left, she added over her shoulder as she disappeared in search of shade. Perspiration beating on my skin, I felt almost a shared affinity with the Iberians, whose heavy clothing must have intensified their discomfort. What an unparalleled experience to be serving as tour guide for my friends, detailing for them the tempestuous early days of contact between Iberians and native peoples, an encounter that will simultaneously launch European imperialism and bring Christ to what is known today as the Global South, widely recognized as the future of Christianity. Given the early 16th century religious tumult in Europe, Iberian Catholicism was necessarily affected by the reforming spirit, and the Mexican Catholicism that developed here did so in direct response to Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation. But that was not all. 16th century Iberians arrived to New Spain with a reconquista mentality, for the Christian kingdoms had spent nearly 800 years reconquering Iberia from the Moors, new converts to Islam who had invaded from northern Africa in 711 AD. Ferdinand and Isabella's defeat of the last Moorish stronghold, the Alhambra in Granada in 1492, had only recently drawn the Reconquista to a close. What began as a feudal struggle to regain lost territories and labor transformed over the centuries into a religious crusade that normalized warfare, produced a class of warrior nobles who viewed manual labor with contempt, generated a fervor of religious superiority, and colored the Iberian response to non-Christians as inferiors worthy only of forced labor and tribute. Reformation and Reconquista, these two R's, would prove a volatile combination in the New World, where the implementation of Christianity would often, though not always, unfold in scenes of coercion and violence. This little cobblestone town, withering in the sun, saturated by humidity, was not here by chance. After Hernando Cortes had erected a wooden cross in the sand, and the Mercedarian priest, Fray Bartolomé de Almedo, had officiated at a dry mass, that is liturgy without the consecration of the Eucharist or distribution of communion, the Iberians set about making camp and searching for firewood. Following Cortes's dinner with Moctezuma's ambassadors on Easter Sunday, his first order of business was to legitimate his venture, since leaving the coast would technically constitute treason. You see, the governor of Cuba, Diego Velázquez, had commissioned Cortes only for an exploratory mission to the mainland without the authority to conquer or settle. The governor was not himself authorized to conquer or settle, being merely a deputy of the hereditary Admiral of the Indies, Diego Colón, the son of Christopher Columbus. But Cortes, desiring to gain renown as a great conqueror, decided to leave Cuba before Velázquez could rescind his commission. Raiding a slaughterhouse in Santiago de Cuba, Cortes set sail immediately with his fleet, gathering supplies and reinforcements along the Cuban coast. After pausing at the island of Cozumel to rescue a shipwrecked Spaniard and skirting the Yucatan Peninsula, he encountered fierce resistance in Tabasco, followed by a gift of 20 indigenous women 
including Malinche, his famous interpreter, before making landfall off the modern day port of Veracruz. Not far from where I was standing, in a politically sophisticated maneuver, Cortes brought to bear the 13th century Siete Partidas of King Alfonso X, which stipulated that Iberian law might be overruled at the demand of all good men of the land. Thus, he came to found what he called La Villarrica de la Veracruz, or the rich village of the True Cross, named to duly recognize its alleged wealth and the fact that the Iberians had alighted on Good Friday. After all, the good men in town had appointed municipal officers, the new municipio of La Villarrica, actually on behalf of the King of, Queen of Spain, of course, named Cortes Alcade Mayor, or Chief Magistrate, Justicia, or Chief Justice, and Captain of the Royal Army, in what was perhaps the first rigged election in Mexico. <laughs> Cortes and his men would construct the actual town further north, here in La Antigua, which today houses ruins of the first municipal buildings in the Americas, including the Armory and Customs House, today known as La Casa de Cortes. The remains of this Andalusian style structure persist only because of ancient tree roots that have snaked their way throughout the 500 year old walls. Still visible are building materials, uh, a blend of river rocks, bricks brought over as ballast on Iberian ships, local cantera stone and coral reef. Stepping gingerly along La Antigua's aging cobblestones, Steve, Martha, and I made our way to the river, along the way happening upon the Ceiba tree, where Cortes famously scuttled his ships, thus preventing anyone in his party from deserting or reporting his treasonous activity to Diego Velasco, Velasquez in Cuba. Cortes did not destroy his caravels immediately, but rather spent time in the area, interacting with the local native peoples, exploring, communicating with Montezuma's ambassadors, and convincing even the ship's crews to join him in the march inland. History enveloped us here in La Antigua, from murals painted along the walls in town commemorating the past, to ancient Ceiba trees that had witnessed the past, to rusty cannons rescued from the river Huitzilapan. According to the guide who took us about in a little riverboat, a local cove served as a popular hideaway for pirates. Even in 2008, he told us, artifacts were being uncovered along the shores, including ships wreckage, cannonballs, and weapons. A light breeze cooled our faces as we puttered up and down the river, listening to our guide describe the rich history of this locale and its, of his people. But the momentary reprieve only intensified the heat when we docked and alighted. Taking leave of La Antigua in pursuit of Cortes, Steve, Martha, and I shared a sweaty taxi ride to the ruins of nearby Sempuela, home of the Totunaco native peoples whose obese ruler had welcomed the Iberians before lamenting to Cortes about his people's subjugation to Montezuma. He would enter into an alliance with Cortes, who, of course, repeated his speech, urging the Totunaco people to give up their idols, embrace the Christian God, and immediately forego tribute to Montezuma. Sempuala was a small but fairly well-preserved site with what appeared to be multiple altars and a gladiatorial ring. Lacking historical markers, we were left to relive the past by consulting the letters of Cortes, which I carried with me, and by using our own imagination. Cortes and his men would remain in this area for several months, so that it would be from this location on August 16, 1519, that Cortes would officially begin his march towards Tenochtitlan, accompanied by 400 Iberians, and 1,000 Sempoalan allies, a number that would swell to the tens of thousands, without whom he never would have vanquished the Mexica people. During the three-month month trek inland, the priest accompanying Cortes to Tenochtitlan, most notably the mercedarian Bartolome de Almedo, pleaded with him not to topple temples and destroy indigenous deities. Undaunted, Cortes continued to raise the Ocali of the native temples, erect wooden crosses, and replace indigenous deities atop bloody sacrificial altars with statuettes of the Virgin Mary in all the polities through which he passed. The conquistador also repeatedly criticized indigenous religious practices, ignoring the counsel of the priest and his company. Such were the inauspicious beginnings of the Christian Christianization of native peoples in New Spain. Meanwhile, across the ocean in Europe, Another sort of tumult was occurring within Christianity. On April 17, 1521, Martin Luther appeared at the Diet of Worms before the 21-year-old Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, formerly Charles I of Spain, to face charges of heresy. 
Luther's ultimate refusal to recant his theological works paired with his excommunication several months prior forced him into hiding. Four months later, following a two and a half year war, Hernando Cortes, his fellow Iberians, a few African slaves, and tens of thousands of indigenous allies vanquished the Mexica people across the ocean in Tenochtitlan on August 13, 1521, the Feast of San Hipólito. Neither Luther nor Cortes would have been immediately aware of the other's activities, yet taken together, their actions would determine the spiritual fate of native peoples in the New World for the next 300 years. The remainder of my talk, I will explore the manner in which Reformation, both Catholic and Protestant, <coughs> manifested among the native people in 16th century New Spain, focusing on three key areas. Sacramental administration, especially of confession, the Mexican provincial councils, especially the second and the third, and pastoral attitudes towards the spiritual aptitude of native peoples. <coughs> Excuse me. To begin, I would like to point out that church and state did not exist independently in 16th century Iberian society, a parallel in pre-Hispanic Mesoamerican culture that lent itself to the introduction of Christianity, as we shall see. Indeed, it was impossible for early modern Iberians to imagine a society in which their faith was not intimately woven into their daily lives. Columbus had, in fact, procured Isabella's support by appealing to her desire to spread the gospel following her triumphant rooting of the Moors from Granada in 1492 after a near nearly 800-year occupation. From the time Columbus set sail in the 1490s, Catholic priests had accompanied explorers on their voyages of discovery to the New World. In addition to providing pastoral care to the crew, clerics were prepared to evangelize any non-believers they might encounter. Importantly, Ferdinand and Isabella, known as the Catholic monarchs after their routing of the Moors, had procured the privilege of patronato real, or royal patronage, which allowed them to appoint clergy in all major ecclesiastical benefices in the Castilian realms, including the Americas. A right yielded to them, after, under a great deal of pressure, uh, yielded to them in a series of 14th and 15th century papal bulls. Though the Iberian monarchy essentially controlled the local Catholic church, to ensure loyalty, Isabella tasked her Franciscan confessor, the Archbishop Fray Francisco Jiménez de Cisneros, with reforming the clergy. By 1517, the archbishop had purged the realm of various abuses, including concubinage and absentee clergy, so that the reform of the hierarchical church, in Iberia at least, was complete by the time Luther posted the 95 Thesis. Cisneros was not suc as successful among the secular clergy as he was among his fellow mendicants, given that 400 diocesan priests fled with their concubines to northern Africa rather than adhere to the Cisnerian reforms. Taken in context with the fact that in 1517 the Franciscans experienced a papal division and reform of their order, many of the first friars in the New World were renowned for their zeal, humanity, and learning. Now, recent research has shown that these friars uh, sort of had um, difficulty balancing their lives of contemplation with being in the mission field, and many of them actually wanted to leave. Uh, that sort of new research that's coming out um, recently. From the moment Cortes arrived to mainland Mexico, he played a role in the introduction of Christianity to New Spain. Not long after vanquishing Tenochtitlan in 1521, he dispatched a letter to Emperor Charles V requesting, specifically, Franciscans to minister to the native peoples because, as he said, they were austere, dedicated to Christ, and wouldn't ask for money. <laughs> Significantly, these friars were from Cortes's home region of Extremadura and would remain his staunchest defenders throughout the colonial period, comparing him to Moses and arguing that because he was born around the same time as Luther, he was ordained by God to serve as Luther's counterpoint, bringing new souls to the Catholic Church to serve um, to replace those who were being lured away by the heretic. In New Spain, the systematic evangelization of native peoples began with the arrival of the Franciscans, the first of whom appeared in 1523 as Mexico City rose among the ruins of Tenochtitlan. Led by the Flemish lay brother Fray Pedro de Ante, the first original friar settled in Texcoco, uh, nearby to current day Mexico City, constructing a chapel, constructing a chapel where the first full mass uh, took place, that is including communion and uh, Eucharist. Um, and distribution of communion. In addition to establishing a school for the sons of indigenous nobles, Fray Pedro de Gante embedded the Roman alphabet into the columns outside of this chapel in order to serve as a teaching tool. <coughs> 
The following year, 1524, saw the arrival of the famed 12 apostles, Franciscans who modeled themselves after Christ's closest followers. Led by Fray Martín de Valencia, here seen, seen kneeling to the left of the cross, here, they would walk barefoot 300 miles from the coast of Veracruz to Nerochtitlan. There, Cortés would welcome these raggedy men with an embrace, startling the indigenous witnesses. Soon thereafter, the friars divided into pairs to found evangelization centers built by native hands, partition the region into dioceses, organize a primitive church structure based on the Mendicant system, and institute the formal study of Nahua culture or Aztec culture as a tool for persuasive evangelization. These early Franciscans would distinguishing them, distinguish themselves by becoming the first New World ethnographers, assisted by their classically educated trilingual indigenous students fluent in Nahuatl, Latin, and Spanish. Eventually, the Franciscans would be joined by 12 Dominicans in 1526 and seven Augustinians in 1533. So important were the friars in this early period, in fact, that scholars designate the years 1524 to 1555 as the Mendicant Church. Now I'd like to pause here for a moment to discuss indigenous religion so you have a better understanding of what the Europeans encountered when they arrived. So the various cultures of Mesoamerica perceived of the, of the natural world as a sacred landscape, believing that objects in the physical world were themselves imbued with the divine. This pantheistic belief included not only a certainty in the supernatural nature of all creation, but also the conviction that all objects, including mountains and towns, were animate. For Mesoamerican peoples to consume the goods of the earth was to consume the supreme spirit, a belief that ensured the careful nurturing of the natural landscape and its products. Religion in Mesoamerican culture served as a unifying factor, permeating every aspect of their existence. Daily life unfolded in a manner predetermined by a pantheon of gods who punished misdeeds with illness and responded to veneration with bountiful harvests and victories in conquest. Simply put, Mesoamerican peoples envision life as a series of exchanges with the deities and the ancestors in the underworld, a perpetual negotiation that could bring about an agricultural surplus if the gods received the, ne the necessary appeasements. The earth, being inhabited by loved ones and deities, functioned as a sacred landscape sustaining mankind. In exchange, it demanded that humans be placed on the earth to be consumed by the gods. Were one indigenous culture to conquer another, the vanquished peoples would recognize the superiority of the conqueror's god by placing that deity atop their religious pantheon while still continuing to worship their own gods. Cultures across Mesoamerica shared basic philosophical and spiritual principles, including human sacrifice, which was their prim the prime aspect around which most religion revolved. The priestly class who oversaw human sacrifice generally possessed the highest levels of culture and learning, and they would plan buildings, direct religious ceremonies, and were advanced in the study of science and mathematics. Because humans were the highest form of life, Mesoamerican peoples considered human sacrifice to be the premier category of exchange with the divine, and in some cases a necessary act to ensure the rising of the sun or the rotation of the earth. The more militant societies in Mesoamerica, like the Mexica, or the Aztecs, satisfied the divine mandate for human sacrifice through the metaphorical performance of warfare, subjecting their captives to heart sacrifice on the pinnacles of Pyramid Mountains. Interestingly and somewhat counterintuitively, similarities between aspects of Mesoamerican religion and Iberian Catholicism eased the transition to Christianity in the early colonial period. Though Mesoamerican peoples were polytheistic, their priests, for example, much like the European clerics who arrived to the New World, were learned, austere, and celibate. Of course, they often engaged in hard sacrifice. Just a slight difference. Uh, more significantly, the early friars perceived in several Nahua rituals a distorted resemblance to certain Catholic sacraments. Indeed, the Franciscan Fray Toribio de Meramente Motolinia was so impressed by the indigence of the native peoples that in his 1541 book, Historia de los Indios de la Nueva España, The History of the Indians in New Spain, he portrayed them as natural practitioners of Franciscan apostolic poverty. In fact, he took his very name from the Nahuatl word for poor person, which he heard the native people say when they heard him walking by in his tattered garments. Not all Europeans, of course, shared Motolinia's sentiment, whereas some early mendicants believed that native people's innocence 
and near nakedness rendered them perfectly poised to receive and embrace Catholicism. Others believed Mesoamericans had been tainted by demons who darkened their hearts and directed them to engage in heinous acts. In part because of Luther and the subsequent exodus of so many Catholics in Europe, the mendicants arrived in colonial Mexico with, an, with unprecedented powers to preach and administer the sacraments in the New World. Whereas friars in the Old World required the consent of the local ordinary to preach and hence lived as itinerant beggars unattached to a church, friars in New Spain not only preached freely, but also founded churches and managed parishes. Pope Adrian VI, 1522 papal bull, authorized mendicants to use any means necessary in the conversion of native peoples if a bishop was not present or at least a distance of two days away. This permission was unprecedented in the history of the Catholic Church, approved as a response to the extraordinary circumstance of discovering an extensive population of non-Christians in desperate need of baptism and eternal salvation. Sacramental administration in New Spain would become especially significant as Protestant theologians in Europe systematically challenged and abandoned several Catholic sacraments. Were it not for Luther, the administration of sacramental confession in New Spain would have proceeded in much the same manner as it had in Iberia for hundreds of years. Instead, we see the effects of the Protestant Reformation as early as 1525, one year after the arrival of the Twelve, with the construction of a sala de penitencia, or primitive confessional, in San Miguel Huejotzinco, one of the first four friaries constructed in colonial Mexico. Erected the same year as La Ermita de Rosario, that little white chapel in the town in La Antigua, San Miguel Huejotzinco is no longer an operational church, but instead houses a wonderful museum dedicated to evangelization. I spent my full right year in San Pedro Cholula, not far from Huejotzinco, so I spent many pleasant afternoons sitting in the courtyard listening to the sounds of the passing people and the birds and, the scent and, and smelling the scent of orange blossoms descending upon me on the breeze as I envisioned colonial friars walking about the colonnades. I came across another Sala de Penitencia when I visited the former Franciscan friary in Cuernavaca in the state of Morelos just outside Mexico City. Uh, and Cortez himself was actually involved in the founding of that friary in 1526. So since the year 1215, when the Fourth Lateran Council mandated annual confession, all Christians who had each the, reached the age of reason were expected to privately confess their sins to their own parish priest once a year. Though ostensibly designed for priests to come to know their parishioners and thus to detect heresy, it unfortunately encouraged priests to know their parishioners. Sexual solicitation during confession, particularly of women, plagued the early modern church, aided by the practice of priests sitting with penitents at their feet. This indeed was one of the complaints lodged against the church by Protestant reformers, resulting in the introduction of the confessional box, most famously implemented in the 16th century by St. Charles Paromeo in Milan. The importance of the Salas de Penitencia in Cuernavaca and Huejotzinco, which as you can see is little more than a window punched into the wall from the outside of the church into the inside, uh, the importance lies in its innovation. The confessional box would appear in Europe in the wake of the reforms of the Council of Trent, an ecumenical meeting convened by the Roman Catholic Church uh, from 1545 to 63 in response to the Protestant Reformation. But importantly, these primitive confessionals in New Spain would predate the Euro European confessional box by 20 years. While it is true that the majority of native peoples confess not in a sala de penitencia, but in a standard European format that is face to face or rather face to knee, without Luther and the critiques of the Protestant reformers, not a single sala de penitencia would have appeared in New Spain. Another way Luther and his reforms affected the administration of sacramental confession in New Spain were the, in the privileges outlined in the aforementioned 1522 papal bull uh, by Alexander VI. Thanks to this bull, the limitations imposed upon mendicant confessors in Europe, that is, the requirement that they have an Episcopal license, did not apply in colonial Mexico. For the first time, friars had full access to penitents under their jurisdiction. In New Spain, confession was the one sacrament native peoples were ex ex encouraged to frequent, communion as a whole being reserved to Spaniards. The primacy of sacramental confession was linked to a Christian's ongoing struggle for justification, providing the penitents only hope of regaining God's grace once it had been lost through sin. The Protestant reformers largely re rejected this notion and abandoned the sacrament, making its accessibility in colonial Mexico one of the Catholic Church's top priorities. <laughs> 
Now, one might imagine the Catholic Church would have had a similar desire to promote the Eucharist among Native peoples uh, in New Spain, since the doctrine of Christ's true presence was absent in, in many the Protestant theologies. And indeed, the 22nd session of the Council of Trent um, stated on September 17, 1562, that, quote, the sacred and holy synod would fain indeed that at each mass the faithful who are present should communicate, <clears throat> end quote. Even so, daily reception of the Eucharist was not widely practiced among lay Catholics until the 20th century after Pope St. Pius X issued a papal bull in 1905. Now, given that 16th century European Christians did not frequent communion, it is not surprising that native peoples were not widely encouraged to approach the sacrament. Pastoral attitudes did differ according to religious order, uh, so that the Dominican friars used the designation communio tlacat, or people of the communion, to designate those indigenous Christians demonstrating sufficient knowledge of faith and virtue to approach the sacrament of communion at any time. Fray Pedro Legante, who you will recall, um, arrived in 1523 and built the little chapel uh, with the Roman alphabet embedded in the columns. He would exhort his neophytes to approach with a pure heart the Tlateochiwali Tlaxcaltzintli, or the blessed little tortilla his Nahuatl term for the Eucharist. <laughs> the tortilla, of course, being an ancient indigenous staple um, to the Americas. Uh, Luther and the advent of the Protestant Reformation in the, whole, in the old world inspired a series of formal ecclesiastical meetings in Mexico City to deliberate the pastoral care of native peoples in New Spain. Hernando Cortes himself insisted in, uh, assisted in organizing the first formal such synod in the fall of 1526, with 19 representative friars, five clergymen, and a handful of jurists in attendance. Discussions centered on sacramental administration, particularly baptism, confession, and communion, as well as the treatment of native peoples. A second ecclesiastical meeting would follow five years later in 1532, producing a series of recommendations for the Spanish crown regarding the political and social organization of New Spain. But the most important of these 16th century ecclesiastical gatherings would take place two decades later. Known as the Mexican Provincial Councils, these meetings generated policies directly informed by new Protestant theologies. During the force, first Mexican Provincial Council, convened by the Bishop of Mexico in 1555, for example, the primary subject was the structure of the fledgling Mexican Catholic Church. The resolutions reached comprise 93 chapters, which included formalizing the tradition of evangelizing in native languages, as well as an attempt not yet successful, to subordinate the mendicants under the authority of the local bishop. Church policy in colonial Mexico would be more directly affected by Luther's spiritual upheaval in Europe during the second and third Mexican provincial councils. The sole reason the Archbishop of Mexico City convened the second provincial council in 1565, in fact, was to implement the reforms of the Council of Trent, whose closing session had occurred two years prior. Trent's numerous reforms and clarifications of Catholic doctrine included codifying marriage, founding seminaries to formalize the education of secular priests, and organizing the church into dioceses under a single episcopal head with jurisdiction over all clergy, secular and regular. This diocesan division was meant to ostensibly regulate the teaching of theology, <clears throat> which sort of makes sense given that Luther was an Augustinian friar. They want to <laughs> make sure they had jurisdiction over preaching. Now, given that the Archbishop of Mexico's, uh, given the Archbishop of Mexico's decades-long struggle to, to control the orders, Trent's mandate that mendicants be placed under Episcopal jurisdiction appeared providential. The regular clergy in Mexico, however, being long accustomed to conducting themselves as virtual bishops, not only refused to acquiesce and accept the reforms of Trent, but threatened to abandon the mission field. Because mendicants minister to native populations, and unlike secular clergy were fluent in indigenous languages, King Philip II petitioned Pope Paul VI to postpone implementing the Tridentine reforms in New Spain to avoid a collapse of the Mexican Catholic Church. And can you imagine? He agreed. Such was the importance of the mendicant church in that early period. It would, be for, it would be the third Mexican provincial council convened in 1585 when the bishops in colonial Mexico would fully implement the Council of, uh, of Trent's reforms. Indeed, scholars have dubbed this council the Mexican Trent. By the 1580s, the mendicants had lodged, 
excuse me. By the 1580s, the mendicants had lost much of their influence, due in part to the arrival of the Jesuits in 1572, the increasing numbers of secular clergy in the Mexican church, and the friars' own disillusionment with their native converts. As such, bringing the mendicants under Episcopal authority was no longer contested. In addition to applying Trent's numerous reforms in New Spain, the Third Mexican Provincial Council also mandated whitewashing the interior walls of all conventos. Friaries, um, uh, friaries often had been built, friaries that had been built with native hands on the former site of indigenous temples using the very same stones. In the early years of evangelization, friars had invited and encouraged native converts to decorate convento walls with images reflecting their new Christian faith. As indigenous artists filled church walls with images of Christ, the Virgin Mary, and other saints, they often included pictorial references to native culture or religion, symbolism that generally went undetected by the colonial friars. The resurgence of iconoclasm among the Protestant reformers fueled concerns for New World clerics about native people worshiping the images they had embedded into Christian art in and around churches, not only in paintings, but also in the atrial crosses erected in church courtyards. As a result of Luther's reforms, only, excuse me, all the indigenous Christian art in colonial Mexican friaries was whitewashed over by decree of the Third Mexican Provincial Council and remained so for the next 300 years. Only in the past few decades have art historians and preservationists begun working to uncover these colonial treasures, many of which are now visible, visible to visitors and scholars. San Pedro Cholula, the dusty little town where I lived for two summers in addition to my Fulbright year, is a perfect example. A former Mesoamerican sacred site dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, the plume serpent, it was renowned as a center of culture and learning with a famed marketplace. Native laborers enthusiastically constructed a massive church dedicated to St. Gabriel, the Archangel, on the site of the recently raised temple using the very same stones. Though this enthusiastic response convinced Iberian friars that native peoples had eagerly embraced Christianity, the reality was that they view the monumental Christian structure as an analog to the pre-conquest temple, and thus as a symbol of their corporate identity. Attempts to build the most splendorous churches in a given region did not so much reflect native engagement with Christianity as it reflected pre-contact practice of dominating one's neighbors with a bigger and better teocali, or native temple. This was especially true of Altepet, or native communities that had enjoyed a sacred identity prior to Iberian invasion, like Cholula. Tlaquilos, or native artists, painted the cloister with scenes from the lives of Christ and St. Francis incorporating in animals indigenous to the Americas that were important to their culture, such as jaguar and deer. Now, in addition to dictating policy, the decrees of the Mexican provincial councils also reveal the waning attitude of clergymen toward the spiritual aptitude of native peoples, which is my last point. This is especially true in the proceedings of the third Mexican provincial council in 1585, which reflect a paternalistic attitude towards indigenous po populations, specifically its declaration that native peoples were not yet fully Christian despite 30 years of evangelization. Contemporary Mexican, excuse me, contemporary Franciscan writings reflect this frustration, evidenced by a disenchanted Fray Eronimo de Mendieta, who concludes in his 1596 book, Historia Ecclesiastica Indiana, or History of the Indian Church, that native peoples were not fit to command or govern but should be commanded and governed. This disillusionment regarding the spiritual capabilities of native peoples developed slowly over the course of the 16th century. The first 12 Franciscans arrived in 1524 enthusiastic about the opportunity to replenish the number of Catholic faithful who had been lost in Europe due to Luther and subsequent Protestant reformers. This optimism did not just expend, extend to the Christianization of the large population of native commoners. Recognizing that an indigenous priest would have a greater influence on local population than a foreigner, church officials established several seminary schools for the sons of indigenous nobles. Chief among them was a Franciscan-run Colegio de Santiago Tlatelolco, just outside Mexico City, founded in 1536 with the support not only of the Spanish Viceroy, but also of Charles V himself. Dressed in cassocks and living a semi-monastic lifestyle, indigenous students studied reading, writing, music, Latin, rhetoric, logic, philosophy, and native medicine. Indeed, visitors to the school repeated hearing native charges speaking Latin with the elegance of Cicero. Mm. 
and purportedly embarrassing local New World Spaniards, many of whom were not as equally educated. Teaching these young boys Latin, the official language of the Roman Catholic Church even to this day, was of course an attempt to preserve one aspect of Roman, uh, one aspect of the Roman Catholic Church, um, of church life that reformers rejected, choosing instead to employ the vernacular in their liturgies and services. In those early years, with the repercussions of the Protestant Reformation still ongoing, the Mexican church retained an optimistic view of their new charges, permitting properly trained native people to be ordained as deacons the lowest step in the sacrament of holy orders. Over time, however, as enthusiasm for the evangelizing project waned, the Colegio de Santiago Tlatelolco would fall into ruin, with the decrees from the Mexican provincial councils formalizing clerical disappointment with native peoples, revoking their ability to become ordained ministers and to assist at mass, and ultimately to even touch the sacred vessels. Similarly, Franciscan writings in the late 16th century no longer contain euphoric descriptions of the successes of evangelization, but instead lament the end of the golden age of the mendicant establishment and the debauchery still prevalent among native converts, especially drunkenness, despite decades of Christianization. As one friar phrased it, evangelization in New Spain had entered a silvery winter. Overall, desire to counteract the effects of Luther in the Old World colored the Catholic Church's approach to evangelization of native peoples in the New World, not simply in its introduction in the 16th century, but for the remaining 300 years of the colonial period. Standing with my friends in the town square of La Antigua on that unbearably humid April afternoon in 2008, gazing upon the oldest operational church in mainland Mexico in the town Cortez had founded, on, whole, on Good Friday, 1519, I contemplated the complicated introduction of Christianity to mainland Mexico. Latin American Christianity, today so vibrant and rich in expression and indeed the future of Christianity in this developing region known as the Global South, had such a difficult history of coercion and at times violence. Martin Luther could have had no idea when he posted the 95 Thesis on that church door in Wittenberg in 1517 that his actions would have such long-term effects on Native peoples a half a world away. Thank you. I have uh, lots of questions. I'm just going to start by, uh, by one. Um, can you talk about uh, writing or translation in Nahua or uh, other Native languages? Yes. <coughs> sure. So Native peoples had um, ideographic writing. Uh, it wasn't Romanized. Um, and there were certain Europeans who didn't really think it was really writing because it was a bunch of images. Uh, the priests were the ones who were trained in reading these images. So they have long codices. They would have been written on deer skin or bar tree bark. It would have been written on both sides. It would have been a folded accordion style and pulled open and could be interpreted um, based on whatever the motivation was in various ways. So when the friars arrived, um, of course, they didn't know Nahuatl. And uh, some of the memoirs of the Franciscans talk about what they did. They prayed a lot. They prayed to St. Joseph for inspiration. And they were inspired to play with the children. So they went out and played ball with the children. And they listened to the way the children spoke. And they got enough of a handle on the language to be able to then have conversations and then found schools. Um, and of course, they uh, alphabetized Nahuatl and then trained their indigenous um, aids to write Nahuatl in Latin script. So the native peoples were involved in the, the um, production of catechisms. Um, the Franciscans and other friars would have written um, compendiums on how to conduct confession in various indigenous languages. Uh, we would have um, Sahagun, one of the Franciscans, produced a Salmodia Christiana. Is, um, basically, he tried to indigen make the, the Psalms indigenous by having references to jade and quetzal feathers and indigenous, and sort of making the saints correspond to indigenous deities. And he had native peoples work with him on that project. So a lot of his work, so he's famous for putting together what's known as uh, the Florentine Codex, a 13 book compendium of sort of encyclopedic knowledge of native peoples, uh, which was confiscated by the Inquisition. Uh, but we do, do have a copy available today. And that's the most important source for anyone working on uh, this period with Christians and Native people. Uh, but apart from that, there isn't mm -hmm. much by way of Bible translation? Oh, uh, there would be, there would have been some. So yes, they used the indigenous languages. It was simply too difficult to try to expect the Native peoples to learn Spanish so quickly. 
So what the um, the friars would do is those some of them would learn the native languages and know it very well, and they would write sermons that in those languages that other Franciscans or um, Dominicans would uh, would memorize, and they would use that sort of Euro European model of the theater of of memorizing um, and just recite a sermon in Nahuatl and not have any idea what they were saying. Uh, so it didn't make for very good, um, you know, catechesis. And of course, there were concepts in Christianity that simply had no translation. Um, you know, the Trinity being difficult even for Christians, there's no way to understand that. Even the word for sin, uh, the, um, the word that they used in Nahuatl meant to dirty oneself physically and to need to physically cleanse oneself. It's the closest that they could get to. Uh, so that, you know, that's problematic. Um, and a lot of the idea of confession, it would have been a sort of um, fit like justice for having committed a crime. And that doesn't really translate. That's not really what the sacrament of confession does in a spiritual sense. But it, so there was a lot of difficulty in, in sort of bringing those concepts to bear. Questions? David, I'm sure you have a piece of um, I'm just trying to process it all. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, uh, it seems like some of what's going on in Mexico is actually running not just, not alongside to trend, but but really counter to it. Mm -hmm. This whole translation, things mm -hmm. like that, all of these are expressly forbidden, forbidden exactly. by trend. Exactly. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's... This is not something Trent wants to in, in, engender. Um, is there much impact out of, uh, out among some of these churches relative to some of the Tridentine things about Native peoples? Because Trent did talk a little bit about Native peoples. To, um, yeah. I, I just need more time to <laughs> sit with all of this. But I think, this. I mean, that's an interesting point because, uh, you know, the Sala de Penitencia, these things sort of predate, um, they anticipate Trent and some of the changes, but then they also, in the New World, are going to be using pastoral sort of decisions that, as you say, Trent is not, is going to condemn. So this is part of the reason why the friars just said, we're not, we're not going to accept Trent. Um, and if you make us, then we will leave. And they were so involved with indigenous cultures, they knew the languages, they had the trust of the people, they were really deeply embedded that if they left, not just the church would collapse, but colonial society would collapse. The Spaniards would lose their hold in the new world. That's how important they were. So it's this, uh, one of them, um, I have a good friend who's a Franciscan in Mexico, and he told me they were rebeldes, they were rebellious. And he was very proud of the fact that his brother friars in the colonial period said, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna listen. You know, you, we have this papal mandate that allows us to act as sort of virtual bishops, and we're going to do that. So if you force us to leave, if you force us to accept it, then we'll just leave, and good luck to you. Cause so it, it's really quite interesting. Um, Latin American theologians ticking off the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a tradition. It begins in that early period. You know, I, I just noticed one thing. When you showed the photograph of the Sala de Penitencia, mm -hmm. there was something which uh, uh, always strikes me, you got the big sunburst mm -hmm, about it. The Eucharist, mm -hmm. And I believe I'm right in saying this, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that's an example of an influence from the Nahua to the Catholic Church, in that that's an Aztec style which is adopted by the Catholic Church. And when they actually um, uh, develop monstrances to show the host in the 16th century, they borrow the Aztec sunburst. And that's where that uh, comes from. Or thus have I read. You know, I hadn't heard that, but that makes sense. Okay. So in other words, it's a style that sure. originates in Mexico and post-Trent with Eucharistic devotion and they borrow it. And it would have represented as well the um, dominance of the Catholic faith and doctrine in front of the, the sun deity, or, or you know, with, if that represents the sun. And that's something we see in Our Lady of Guadalupe in the imagery as well. curious about the resistance to allowing the indigenous people to like participate in the sacrament and those kinds of things. Um, like what was the rationale for that? Was it was it just 
a, like an ethnic issue, or was it the fact that they were statistic or something? They so initially, of course, everyone's enthusiastic about the changes, but then they they say some of the the writings um, that the Franciscans that we have today say that the native peoples are not fit. Um, to be celibate. Basically, they're too inclined to marriage is the way it's worded. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so they, they worry that they're not going to really be celibate. Um, they worry that they're going to worship their images that are embedded. Even in atrial crosses, which I don't think I had an image of that, they sometimes had thorns and they had various images that might have looked like the maybe the thorns of Christ's crown, but it really wasn't. So it was a way for them to put in their own ideas. So once the Franciscans and other friars sort of realized that this was happening, they became very concerned. And they said they're just too new and they can't, um, they can't understand it. And it's just too much to think that. And that does, that's not to say that there were no indigenous priests, because there were. They were sort of scattered. But I did come across a recent source um, that has two brothers who are Nahuas, and they both become priests, which is unusual. And they're in the central valley of Mexico, and they're writing and producing you know, theological work. So that's something that does happen. It's not very prevalent. I believe, I may be wrong here, you mentioned the uh, Virgin Mary particularly in this story. Uh, uh, except for the statues that Cortez placed of her. No, sure. I, I didn't really. Um, so, so Our Lady of Guadalupe is, of course, a story that's based in this, oh, there's my son crying, <laughs> based in the 16th century, according to the story. Um, this takes place in 1531. Um, if any of you are familiar with the historical artifacts, the first written source we have is from 1648 in Nahuatl, uh, and then 1649 in Spanish and Nahuatl, so the, they sort of come back to back. Uh, but... I've read most of the Franciscan writings from this period, and none of them mention her, Our Lady of Guadalupe, in, in at all. Uh, and so, generally, 16th century histori historians who focus on 16th century Mexico, we don't really talk about her, and I don't even really notice she's absent because she's not in an, the historical record, really, until later. So, whereas I grew up Mexican Catholic, believing that, oh, she came in 1531, and everybody converted, and Mexico's Catholic now. That's the story I heard. Um, when I went to um, ask Matthew Westall about it when I was at Penn State, he said, mm, not really, let me hand you this book by Stafford Poole and this book, you know, by David Brading. And, uh, and uh, so reading about that, I realized that it's not in the historical record, it's more of a tradition, which of course is part of, you know, Catholic, um, the Catholic Church focusing on tradition and, um, and scripture. But, but that's why she doesn't really enter into my work. I thought that she would, but she really does not. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. Um, um, I wondered if there was uh, any serious evidence about um, Lutheran or Calvinist thought in New Spain. I mean, in, in other words, it, it seems like a lot of what they're doing is anticipating mm -hmm. problems, but I, I wondered about, I mean, are there priests I or lay people or, so or anybody who, who was, you know, they were having to shut down? They, yes. So we have Inquisition documents, and I actually have some from my town. Uh, the unfortunate one I have for my town is a man who was talking with his neighbors about Luther and said that labor, Luther, he wasn't that bad of a guy. Mm -hmm. That was enough for the Inquisition to come and, and take him and throw him in jail for a while until they made him promise, please never mention the name of Luther again. So they let him out, uh, but, but, <laughs> but then he does apparently mention Luther and ends up back in jail, and I think my document ends and I don't know what happened to him. So there was definitely an attempt um, to prevent any Protestant theologies from entering that doesn't of course wasn't necessarily successful but a lot of this is underground work and this is work that's sort of just going on now with historians I don't particularly focus on Protestant um, Protestants in the New World but I know some colleagues who are and it's very fascinating to see what they're uncovering because there's evidence um, also in Spain in um, 16th century Spain we have historians working on hidden Protestants sort of in that culture uh, so in order to come to the New World um, Spaniards had to demonstrate that they had several generations of, they were old Christians for several generations without Jewish or Muslim blood. So they would need an actual um, like piece of paper, a limpieza de sangre, to, to prove that they were clean. Of course, that doesn't, you could buy one. Um, but ostensibly, you were Catholic, and you were an old Catholic, and you would come over. So that was sort of the, the attempt. And then the Inquisition is implemented in 15, I believe, 74, 71. Um, and at first, Native peoples are 
are sort of judged by the Inquisition, but then there's this big controversy when a native lord, um, Don Carlos, had, um, who was trained in Santiago Tlatelolco, the Franciscan college, um, is burned at the stake by the first um, Franciscan bishop. And everyone, this is a huge controversy, and um, the, the church comes out and says the, the native peoples are too young and new in the faith. They cannot be burned at the stake. So he was stripped of his inquisitor sort of duties, and native peoples from that moment on are no longer subject to the Inquisition. Only Europeans um, or mestizos or even Africans, I suppose, are. And native peoples instead have are under the jurisdiction of what's called a provisorato de indios. It's sort of a ecclesia. Uh, it's made up of bishops who sort of judge them. Um, and we have evidence of people trying to pass as native people to get out of like the Inquisition. <laughs> so it's it's very interesting moment where people are trying to not move up and sort of to whiten themselves, but to try to claim if they're mestizos that they're going to claim full indigenous blood so that they don't have to be tried by the Inquisition. Hmm. <coughs> I mean, I'm kind of scraping my memory here. <coughs> so, are, are, are there really attempts to use native music for Christian purposes. Yeah, so one of the things about indigenous cultures, I sort of mentioned it briefly, is that there are a lot of overlap between Christian ritual uh, or Catholic ritual and indigenous ritual. So the idea of processions and images and music, um, perhaps dancing and decorating lavishly the altars, that made sense to native people. So they would do that, but there was a concern in some of the documents that maybe they were doing it too well or doing it, you know, sort of directed towards their deities and not the Christian um, God. Uh, but there definitely was uh, use of that. And we have um, indigenous language um, plays as well that were put on. There's a play called Holy Wednesday that was put on on the Wednesday of Holy Week. And native peoples were involved in the production of these plays. And they're much like medieval, um, what are they called? The, like the That's medieval, pa yes, passion plays with where you have like, um, death and you know all these personifications but they're in they're sort of put into an indigenous context so you would have sweeping because sweeping in front of an indigenous altar was a really important part of indigenous culture so they would have things like sweeping and time and death and they would have have a you know elaborate stages where people would fall into purgatory and you know flames would come out and things like this so it was <laughs> uh, it was something that native peoples um, they had their own cofardias which of course was brought over from Europe and in the cofradías, native peoples could take um, a leadership role, including women. It was one of the places where women and even children would participate. And it, it goes back to that pre-contact conquest desire to outdo your neighbors. So these cofradía performances could be incredibly lavish because they wanted to have the biggest church and the best, you know, fiesta to the to the patron saint. Uh, and that's something even today you see a little bit of in Cholula, where I live. There was a there was a celebration every day. The cohetes or the firecrackers would go off every single day when I lived there, and there was a different saint being celebrated by the different barrios. So how did they deal with secretism? Um, and also, just like another question, like what did they view as secretism? Like how far was too far for them? That, I mean, that's an issue we see everywhere Christianity goes, right? Just sort of how much of the culture. So we do have certain decrees and documents. Um, so I, c I can recall one about the use of feathers on the altar. Uh, my poor baby. Uh, the use of feathers on the altar. And so there was a concern that the Native peoples were dancing with the feathers and placing them on the altar, and that's a little bit too much. So let's just like maybe put them on the altar, maybe not dance with them. So there are things like that where there is a bit of concern. Um, and the, the Christians would um, replace the indigenous deities. So like the war god becomes Saint Michael the Archangel. So they try to make it a little bit similar, um, uh, but sometimes there's a, sometimes it doesn't quite translate. And then, for example, Santiago Matamoros, right? Um, saint James, the Moor Slayer, the patron saint of Spain, he comes over and he's renamed Santiago Mata Indios. So Saint James, the Indian Slayer. And there are stories, according to the uh, chaplain of Cortez, when he writes up a big mem um, biography of Cortez, there are uh, <laughs> stories that the Virgin Mary appeared during the conquest and threw sand in the eyes of the Nahuas so that they would, um, you know, couldn't see. And there are also stories that Santiago appeared on his horse, 
and slayed the native peoples. Um, now, one of Cortez's um, men wrote something called the true history of the conquest where he denied that. He said, you know, I'm not a learned priest like this other author and maybe I'm just a sinful man, but I was there and I never saw Santiago or the Virgin Mary. Maybe I just missed it. So, but, uh, but the native peoples loved Santiago. They actually loved his horse um, more than, than Santiago the Saint. And they have, um, you can see in museums, these sort of, um, I guess like paper mache or I don't know what they would make. They would construct these horses that they would get inside and like wander around and have yeah, festivals honoring the horse of Santiago rather than Santiago himself, which of course would, doesn't make sense because he slayed them. So, yeah. uh, but they love the horse. And so the, the horse of Santiago becomes this really important um, festival honoring him. I don't have any very uh, elaborate agenda here, but I, w what I would like to do in this part uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the event is just move from a, maybe a more specific studies to talk about general um, questions or points that we might want to do as we look uh, in a more um, global way, and if we are doing uh, uh, trying to form um, an agenda of what we need to uh, look at next, where do we go? <laughs> What's uh, if we were holding an event like this uh, in a year's time, for example? Mm -hmm. And uh, what would be the really interesting uh, uh, questions that you would like to see um, addressed? And anyone could feel free to take that. Well, Go I'll ahead. start, and Please. I'm really sorry I missed the end of your paper, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll tell me about it at dinner. Um, but what I what struck me, actually, Philip, and as I said, I'm already very grateful to you for pushing me to think about the work that I was doing in a more global context, um, because I think one of the things that I definitely learned was this, that when I pushed the ideas that I was thinking about, already thinking about the differences that I saw between medieval Christianity and modern Christianity, and then when I took those and pushed them just one area, I just went to Africa, um, just a little bit into Africa, um, what I saw was that the, the, the concerns that I had about modern Christianity and women really were very culturally construed. Um, and and that, that was very stark to me as I, as I moved it out to Africa, how much, and I'm, in fact I already said this, but how much culture influences mm -hmm. the way that we see the church and the way that we practice the church and the way that we see scripture. I think that's really an important part and because of course one of the legacies of the Reformation is thinking about going back to scripture and using scripture alone to interpret our faith. But it's hard for us to do that when our scripture, the way we see scripture is always, um, is, is always formed by who we are and where we live. And so I think that was one of the, is thinking about women and women's roles and thinking how much our ideas about women in the modern church really are socially constructed and culturally mm -hmm. constructed. And if we can let people see how much, um, how different it is when we move out, how different people have thought about Paul and interpreted Paul in women's roles, then I think it can help us address some of these modern problems mm -hmm. more when we move it out. So I think that was one of the biggest things that it really struck me is moving beyond the Western perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so, Right, and I think sort of to uh, continue on with that thought, in thinking about Latin American Christianity, um, been in some of the research and reading I've been doing, <coughs> reading about those who grew up south of the equator, so the Christian calendar is reversed. So how does that affect Christianity when instead of Christmas being you know, the end of the darkness and for the bringing of the light, yes. it's in the spring? Uh, and I think that's, uh, that sort of challenges us to think beyond our Europeanized, because um, honestly, I never thought of that until I read that from somebody. And I thought, of course, that makes sense. Why would I not mm -hmm. have thought of that? Uh, that sort of tries, it challenges us to come out of this European, sort of Eurocentric perspective and to realize, um, because that would, that would also affect Africa, and, mm -hmm. right? Um, what does that mean when Christianity is plopped out of Western Europe in a, in a place where the seasons don't align with what the church is trying to do? Mm -hmm. I think also for at least what I was looking at, thinking about Christianity um, and not just Europeans bringing Christianity to Africa, but that Christianity already existed in Africa, mm. and looking more for those points of continuity where um, we know that their Ethiopia, Ethiopians came to Jerusalem, came to Rome, mm -hmm. would have encountered pilgrims from Europe there. So do we have any records of these encounters? Um, where are these points where Christians from different parts of the world who, who do have different um, theological understandings of Christianity but are still coming to these same holy sites? Um, how, is that, how is that impacting 
the way they view Christianity and, and are there more points of contact than we realize in the narratives mm -hmm. that we're currently that we're currently using to talk about Christianity. I, I, I just pass on one story which uh, uh, speaks to that. Um, when um, uh, Walter Raleigh uh, was in uh, uh, was in prison in the early 17th century, he uh, you know he uh, done all this work in Virginia, but it just wasn't enough, so he got thrown into prison. And he writes this history of the world, and he doesn't have all his sources, <laughs> and he has this absolutely totally mysterious section on the Book of Enoch which nobody in Europe knows about at that point. And he says, oh, I'm getting this from Tertullian. No, you're not. <laughs> um, but where he's getting it from is very interesting. Through the 16th century, there's an Ethiopian monastic house in Rome. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, that's where he's getting it. That's and uh, mm. one French scholar it talks to these Ethiopians, picks up all this completely bizarre lore, and it feeds a very sort of underground in European culture. But who would have thought there's an Ethiopian Orthodox monastery in Rome? Mm -hmm. Very strange stuff. Yeah, so mm -hmm. things like that that we just, yeah. that are not part of our current narrative, mm -hmm. but that provide a more global idea about Christianity in a much earlier time frame than the colonial encounters that we think mm -hmm. of with Africa, especially. Mm -hmm. So what are the... Um, um, agenda items might we uh, um, think about? I'll just throw out uh, one which is maybe the contact with other religions, not primal religions that they can't even see as religions, just as some bad thing they're doing out there mm -hmm. inspired right. by the devil, <laughs> but when they run up against world religions like mm -hmm. Islam and Hinduism mm -hmm. and Buddhism and so on. Um, I remember having a conversation several years ago at the King James Bible mm -hmm. Conference. Um, with Lam and Santa about the influence of Islam on how modern Christians read the Bible. And that was absolutely fascinating where he talked about, you know, the emergence of literalism and the literal, the way that we regard that the, the word of God is not just as um, seen, it, you know, instead of it being the word of God as filtered through the, the people that God designated and inspired to actually write the text, and so therefore the, you know, the same weight is not put on the words, you can translate it, etc. And when that comes into contact with Islam, where the word of God is the literal word of God, and so you're not really supposed mm -hmm. to mess with the language, it's supposed to be Arabic. And, and he suggested to me that maybe some of our literal influence that we have in Christianity today actually came from the, mm -hmm. the Christian culture and Islamic culture, you know, that influence um, on, and I thought, well, modern Christians would be horrified by yeah. that if they thought about the way, you know, that these fundamental in, um, tendencies perhaps come by the influence mm -hmm. of Islam. So that really struck me. I mean, I just think about when we think about not just how um, Christianity has influenced other places, but then how these other places have influenced Christian mm -hmm. thought and how that mm -hmm. changes and affects the way that we practice Christianity today. I mean, I just think that's so important. I think it would change a lot, um, help us better understand a lot of problems in the world today if we could get those cultural contacts. Mm -hmm. um, so I was also thinking about the story of Mary Magdalene now, which no, we do no, know no. that uh, you know is a very progressive story in the West, and it probably does. A lot of these progressive roots are in the East and where mm -hmm. it comes from. So even that, following that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you've got, you've got the word of the Bible mixed with the culture of the Bible, uh, the Jewish history and, uh, and, and God's history. You know, you've got all those mixed together, which, which we've tried to inculcate into different worlds, you know, but we've got a culture we're dealing with there that has, has some impact upon how those words are, are used, you know, in, in those times, and Jesus' words, and Paul's words, and, and yet there was a culture there that we've all learned from, tried to transpose to other cultures, doesn't work well, and uh, now we're learning, you know, that, that uh, there's more to the story, you know, than what we originally thought. Right. We were trying to force that culture and the words of God on other people who have a whole different view of things. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Looking back, um, uh, Frank, uh, would there be much you would say about uh, how the Catholic Church responds in terms of uh, gender terms? I mean, there's presumably been a lot done in terms of how the friars treat women as opposed to men in this mm. uh, world? Or? Um, 
I, I, well, you know, I don't particularly work with women, but after hearing their speeches, the, the talks today, I sort of wish that I did. <laughs> and I might turn a little bit more in that direction now. But um, women sort of had a, a space to to be active in the church, in the gofradias, as I mentioned. They could be leaders. Um, they could be catechists. Hmm. Um, they really didn't, they weren't allowed to... Um, to be leaders in other ways. So that was really the, the place where women, in indigenous women could have an opportunity. And then we also had indigenous women being barred from convents for a while. Oh, okay. um, so they weren't even allowed to become nuns. Mm -hmm. um, they all have, were European or mestizo um, until later into the, into the colonial period they eventually did allow women. Um, but so we have that sort of similar attitude towards barring indigenous men from the holy orders and barring indigenous women from, from convents. Hmm. Does that have to do a smaller concern over their their ability to be chaste, like you said earlier? Uh, didn't believe that you know, I'm not I'm not sure if, if the women it was so much about chastity as it was perhaps intellectual ability. I'm not really sure all of the reasons, the most important reason, but it would be a blend of those reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but it also, these were very opulent places, and you had to have a lot a large dowry to give to enter into them. And native people, certain <laughs> many of them, just simply didn't have <laughs> the, the money to do that. So that, that was it's expensive. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> were some nuns and entrances. Were these royally established numbers? The convents. Um, you know, I don't know that much about them. Um, I suppose some of them would be would have been. Uh, because, like I said, the Spanish crown had the ability to found all the churches and everything um, and in the enclosed? New World, so mm -hmm, they Maybe. would have been enclosed. It just looks like a long <laughs> way to go. So <laughs> just been, like, I, I'm just imagining some poor young Spanish woman arriving mm -hmm. in Mexico in July and going, what if I done? <laughs> right? Um, the greatest uh, colonial uh, Mexican writer is, of course, a nun. Mm -hmm. Yes, so mm -hmm. But that was really, as we know, her only option if she wanted to be a writer was to become a nun because she wouldn't have had that opportunity otherwise. So there was that limitation on women as well. Mm -hmm. Same thing as, as in Europe. Mm -hmm. But so also a kind of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Can I ask about the catechizing? The women, mm -hmm. could they, was it only to other women that they could do? Like what we... You know, we saw the gender divide in Africa, right. but it was, I don't I found that really fascinating how they had these networks that mm -hmm. they created that, that were was. not based upon the household structure and, um, and in which women had complete authority to teach right. other women and men had, I mean, it was, it was really fascinating. It's sort of this, right. uh, and so I was curious when you That's said really catechize. That's I don't know that I, like I said, I don't work enough on that particular right. aspect of the church. But I would like to find out. Mm -hmm. And you know, women would uh, be able to participate in the Cofradia plays. So um, you know, sometimes oh. in Europe, men were the only ones who were in the, the plays, and then they would even pl take the female parts. But I think women were able to act in some of these plays. Mm -hmm. um, so so we have that sort of difference. But I'll, I'm going to look into that. That's interesting to see what who they were who they were they teaching. were allowed to yeah, teach. Yeah, who they were mm -hmm. teaching. If it was just if it, yeah, oh, that was women or. Children. I'm again, sort of scraping the bottom of my memory, but I think in the Maya world, there's a theory that a lot of the Kufradias, uh, the confraternities, were basically old Mayan priestly sure. societies <laughs> who basically just changed their uniforms mm -hmm. and showed up as the mm -hmm. Kufradia. Well, I mean, that's uh, what happened in Cholula, this place that I study, which was such an important pilgrimage site and cultural center, and all Native peoples would come here before... Um, assuming leadership in their home polities, they would come to a legitimation ceremony in the Quetzalcoatl Sanctuary, receive special um, sort of um, piercings and other things, and go home and then assume leadership. And they couldn't do that without first going there. So when the Franciscans come, uh, they sort of think that the Native peoples are very enthusiastic about becoming Catholic. And really, it's sort of, they want to maintain, this is what I argue in my work, is that they want to maintain that sort of pre-conquest identity, spiritual identity, as being the dominant mm -hmm. in the region. So they have a bigger, Huajotzinco is nearby, and it's one of the first conventos, but it's small compared to the massive church we have in Cholula, uh, because they want to, again, maintain that identity. I want to tell um, Beth something that, uh, that she will love, which is the manual that they use for treating the pagan temples is the letter 
of Gregory oh, to Augustine <laughs> from Bede, which, which says, look, you've got a nice pagan temple there, don't just tear it down, you put some statues in it, yeah, call it a church. Yes. And they love that passage, and they circulate it very widely in Mexico. That <laughs> That's what, well, so I would, the, whenever you said at the beginning, yeah. I was thinking. You know, well, if you take students to Celtic parts of Northumbria mm -hmm. and into Scotland or, or into um, Ireland, almost always uh, on a really, really old church site, you will find somewhere very, very nearby a sacred well. Right. right? Because wells are so important to Celts, right? That, that all goes back mm -hmm. to, to there. And they learn, they learn a wicked important lesson there in, in how to, to make this transition. So the one sort of thing that I would add to what's the next thing we do mm -hmm. on some of this globalization is to also really begin to talk about indigenization mm -hmm. and, and, and that, because you know, I teach 1350 here. Mm -hmm. I don't teach uh, religion 1350. I don't teach world history. I do the history of Christianity, and one of the things that at least Baylor kids assume is that the Christianity that we practice in our churches is sort of like Christianity unadulterated, <laughs> right? But it's it, not influenced it, by anything. It's not else. influenced right. by yeah. anything. Scripture what we have is we have we have good Bible Soul scriptural scripture. religion yep. Soul scripture. And, <laughs> and, and a recognition that. Um, all Christianity is enculturated, and and you even you can even see that in the Didache, you can see it in the Gospel of John, <coughs> right? Mm -hmm. And and that comes as this sort of revelation, but it's also one that hasn't really sunk down into even the textbooks mm -hmm. on Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you talk to profs and stuff like that, they'll be able to talk about it. But in textbooks, we really don't mm -hmm. even talk a lot about indigenization. And that Christianity walks in and can change a place, but everywhere Christianity <laughs> walks in and changes a place, it walks out changed itself. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would also add one thing, which is uh, uh, one thing which we don't recognize as unusual is through most of Christian history, the normal Christian experience is as an oppressed majority or an oppressed minority. So, for instance, in Middle Eastern countries, there are normally Christian majorities in Muslim ruled countries. So, the experience of being ruled by another religion mm -hmm. or another anti religious system is the norm in Christian history. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. exceptional. And mm -hmm. that's very hard to tell Americans. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. No, yes. that's very true. Mm -hmm. I had a. Um, sorry, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, you please. Oh, uh, I was just about to say, I. Um, a couple summers ago, I actually uh, worked with this refugee ministry, and the uh, my supervisor was a uh, refugee from the underground church in uh, Soviet Russia, mm -hmm. and um, so I, I was just talking to him about some of the uh, controversies that Baptists have had over the, in America, and he's like, "That's really interesting because." Uh, in Soviet Russia, you were either a Christian or you weren't, so like, right. <laughs> it kind of put things into perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, we really do have it a lot better here than, <laughs> than uh, mm -hmm. we have a lot more time just to th sit and think and to argue with people <laughs> about silly things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, on the, the topic of enculturation, uh, I kind of wanted to kind of ask for y'all, because I'm curious, like, like Anna, you're, you have this document that has these, you know, you know, Eastern Mediterranean sources mm -hmm. potentially, but then there's some things that are added. You know, I was curious about like how many how many women were added that were specifically mm -hmm. Ethiopian women versus right. like other stories that mm -hmm. were incorporated. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, like on the same note, like Dr. Gutierrez, I remember you gave a, lec a lecture at uh, the last conference for faith and history that was mm -hmm. very much this kind of like enculturation mm -hmm. uh, and these kind of blending together. So frankly, I, like from the basis of your guys' research, uh, I'm curious to hear you guys talk about the way you see that informing uh, the conversations that you just had with us. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, there are several, I don't know, I don't have like a number for you of how many, um, 
of the women that I talked about were specifically Ethiopian saints. The last one, though, Bolada Petro, she is um, one of the most well-known Ethiopian saints, and, and she has a much longer uh, hagiography. Hers is, I think, about 40 folios, maybe, long. Um, and so it, it's a much more extensive hagiography, uh, but she's also a later saint. So we, we have more information um, from her. But um, as far, I think what's interesting is that... Um, that we have these these saints' lives that, that did start somewhere else but then are adapted into a different culture. And kind of, I think what was interesting at least with, or what I was hoping to do with this was looking at how um, these same stories that we get from these early Syria, Syrian and Coptic sources are changed depending on the cultural context they go into. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that we start with some of the very, the very same stories, um, and, and a lot of them are repeated. I mean, Paul is in both. Um, Mary Magdalene is in both, but the, but the way that we see them is that their stories are very different. And so what, what the culture chooses to emphasize and how much they keep and how much they add to, I think, is telling of the, the cultural priorities more so than the actual stories of the saints' lives. And so in some ways it's the idea that the stories we tell say more about us than they do about the story we're telling. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that in some case, in some way that's what's happening here is that um, we're seeing the cultural influence on stories that existed somewhere else, but um, how they're adapted in two very different contexts, in a sa- similar time frame, but two very different contexts. Uh, and so. I, I would take what you just said and make, put that on your business card. <laughs> with your, the stories we tell. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. if, um, I, uh, if I hadn't believed it, I wouldn't have seen it with my own eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Josh, I started counting the saints because I like to count things. Yes. So I started counting all of the, 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 the I, I do. I have a spreadsheet. I've gotten about uh, about three fourths of the way through the, the book of the saints. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've been counting out the different women and the different men that, that are in there. And what I've found right now, it looks like about a quarter of the saints are women, which is actually a pretty high number, you know, and I haven't gotten all the way through, so I don't want to stake my soul on that yet, but um, but it's a higher number than what I was expecting, um, and a lot of them I do not recognize at all. They seem, mm-hmm. so I would suspect that there are a lot, a lot of them are um, maybe not from Ethiopia, but are not, not as commonly known stories that are out there, and so there, there's a lot, because I'm like, I've had to look up a lot to see, is this male or female? I've had to do a lot of that because I just you know, didn't have, a, um, didn't have the ability to know that. So I do think that, that that tells us something, that there may be a higher percentage um, of the women in these stories. Something else that I was thinking to, to about, I was reading Wendy Belcher's book, mm-hmm. and one of the things that struck me was that she commented that the female saints in, um, in Ethiopia in the Book of the Saints did not act like, Christian, like we expect Christian women to act, um, they're actually violent, <laughs> and um, they lie, and they, yeah, and they, they not just, they don't just reject authority. One of the things I hadn't thought about this, but in when you read like the Golden Legend, you see the women. They'll say, "I will not do this," but the way that they do it, it's often, you know, they're often looking up at the sky, or they're looking at their cross, or they're looking mm-hmm. at the instruments. I mean, it's sort of this. It's they're rebelling, but there's clearly this, you know, connection. I'm sort of above this world. Whereas these <laughs> Ethiopian saints, it's like this very aggressive sort of like, you know, leading rebellions against the men. Leading Mm-hmm. rebellions against the the attackers and and one of the, uh, one of the things struck me too about it it said that these lots of these women are not nice women no, and yeah no. I mean they are just mm-hmm. not nice they they don't do what we would consider to be right. the idea of Christian Same. womanhood mm-hmm. right. um, so even thinking about these gendered conceptions of what men and women are supposed to do they they change dramatically and these are revered mm-hmm. saints mm-hmm. in Africa and yeah. they, they don't they to poverty yeah. and chastity and assassination <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah, no it's very true so that that yeah, was so definitely nice. struck yes. me it changes our I understanding of who women are and who women are supposed to be. Mm-hmm. That's a very good point. That is a wonderful book, by the way. It is. It was, it's, oh, a beautifully, it was. it's a beautifully written mm-hmm. book. So mm-hmm. I'm very much looking forward to uh, getting here, her to visit here in some capacity. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Great photographs, too. Please. Um, as like, the discipline of church history kind of moves towards a more global perspective, do you anticipate um, more focus on Pentecostalism especially in light of demographic trends as well? Um, good point. I mean, I would think so. I mean, especially in Latin America, I don't do the modern period, but that's certainly becoming really important um, Mm -hmm. in Latin America, and things are changing rapidly. So that's certainly going to be a conversation in Latin America. Particularly with Pentecostalism, there is, in some Pentecostal denominations, a a greater greater emphasis on women's leadership. Yes, Mm -hmm. right, Mm right. 
you know, it's, sorry, kind of, it's kind of interesting. That, um, if you go to Brazil, uh, th there's an absolutely magnificent novel, which is commonly regarded as the greatest Brazilian novel. It's by a guy called Lucretius de Cunha. It's called Revolt of the Backlands. What's kind of interesting is it talks about a fringe religious movement um, and he's absolutely soaked in all these early Christian movements and he links them to the Montanists and uh, they're women-led and they're spirit-led. I think this just sounds so much like Brazilian Pentecostalism, but it's written like 10 years before the Azusa Street Revival. Mm -hmm. oh. um, and you read this and you, you think, I, I've got the copyright date wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this guy's so soaked in all Christian history. Hmm. Um, and it's almost like the Montanists have reappeared in the 1890s. That's great stuff. That's but uh, hmm. so many movements where you have these uh, spirit-led, charismatic-led, hmm. women-led movements, and they're the precursors of Pentecostalism. Hmm. Right, and in Latin America's case, yeah. it would predate contact, European contact, because a lot of indigenous cultures would have had different understandings of the roles of women yeah. and women um, leading in equal parts to men uh, with rulership. So they, so in a sense, it's almost sort of going back to the Pentecostalism and that movement towards female leadership is kind of going back to the pre-contact period um, with indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Please. Are there any compendia of global Christian history, you know, or uh, you should write one, Phil. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, I mean, uh, across time and, and there, across the world, few, and you know, or yeah. are, are there catalogs of global Christian history where you could go read, you know, one time period about what was going on in this part of the, you know, in the world yeah. here, and uh, do you know of anything like that? There, there are a series of. Um, of textbooks and collections of uh, essays, uh, Koshalka, I wish I can spell for you at some point, uh, <laughs> and uh, Frieda Ludwig uh, did a big uh, collection. Darren Doherty has written a couple of textbooks and they've got tons of references. Um, but um, you know, wh wh one reason I'm interested in an event uh, like this is world Christian history, global Christian history. Uh, is a very, very major emerging thing mm -hmm. in schools of religion and seminaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. The um, and you know, in a sense, we're making it up as we go along, which is great. <laughs> uh, but the textbooks are are definitely out there now. Because they're not using that Christendom anymore. Mm -hmm. well, <laughs> but do I feel like Rush now? There's always, there's always Google. You know, that's uh, true. You can find it all there, yeah, but it's yeah, not yeah. all in one yeah. place. But yeah, histories of world Christianity. There's there's now several uh, very good ones. Okay, well, uh, are there any more uh, questions for our panelists, please? Going back to an earlier comment that you were talking about of preventing indigenous people from joining the clergy or preventing them from joining a convent or something, was that more of like a cultural discrimination or would it have been gender-based of like, or being discriminated for different reasons, mm -hmm. like women couldn't join for different reasons and men couldn't join? I think it was more culturally based because we had, like I mentioned, the 800-year war of the Reconquista really colored Iberians' attitudes towards the other and made them think that they were superior because, of course, God was on their side to help them to win back and reconquer these lands for Christianity. So, And then when you have what's happening in Europe, oh, well, then they added sort of divinely inspired mission to replenish the numbers of the Catholic Church. Um, so they do consider themselves to be superior intellectually and culturally, and it's going to be for those reasons. I, I would say I would argue more than a gendered reason why you wouldn't allow Native peoples into um, these sort of spiritual roles um, based on them, the, consider, the idea that they're not able to understand the complications of Christianity, as if Christians can really understand <laughs> the complexities of Christianity. Um, and I mean, there are, like, there are certain words that, and again, like the concept of a devil or Satan doesn't make sense. They had to use evil owl man, which was this malevolent creature that would swoop down and maybe get you if you did something um, you know that was like criminal. It doesn't. It doesn't make sense. Um, but uh, you know, there were attempts to understand and relate to the local cultures. For example, confirmation, um, the idea of becoming a soldier for Christ. Uh, the some of the priests would talk about jaguar warriors who were really important in Mesoamerican culture, Mexica culture, and say that you were like putting on the jaguar skin of Christ. For confirmation, and so you see, like the image I had of the, let's see where it is, the jaguar 
towards the end here. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Jaguar. So it makes more. It was. This was a really important. Becoming a Jaguar warrior in Michigan culture was sort of the top warrior level that you could achieve. So, you know, the friars perhaps not understanding all of this. You know, there's a Jaguar in there, but then of course it's going to be washed, whitewashed over later. But I think the main answer to your question is it's more cultural and thinking that these are primitive cultures. Um, you know, the writing system isn't quite up to par as European writing systems, and um, and they're of course been distorted by Satan because they commit human sacrifice on a daily, mm -hmm. perhaps daily level, on sacrificial altars, which is a distortion of sort of the Eucharistic understanding of Christ's si spiritual sacrifice that takes place on the altar. So. I wonder if there were, and I, I don't know this about Mexico, I wonder if there were examples of native beatas who per performed sort of even yes. though they weren't permitted in the convents, mm -hmm. they do have. They were able to open up that space. We do have that. Okay. Similar Society. to Spain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and many of them, uh, unfortunately, a lot of what we know about them is from Inquisition documents. Sure. sure. Uh, well, those would be but the false but right? mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but, uh, but women would have been um, suspect if they were, you know, to to identify and to live the life as beatas. Can you so say a little bit more that. about that for those of us who don't know? Oh, so it would just simply be women who would sort of live um, the life akin to a religious order, but not formally be admitted to a religious order. So perhaps oh. dressing or living tertiary in a certain orders. way. I'm sorry? Tertiary orders. The tertiary orders? No. Yes. No. The leg? No, 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 I think. Less no. formal. Oh, less formal no. than that? The no. jeans would be closer. Oh, okay. No. It's really? less formal. Yeah. No. In fact, you know, okay. the first Latin American state was a beata, which is St. Rosalina. Mm -hmm. Which means a, a so blessed. Begins is not far Okay, right. No, Thank you. Official. I understand now. Right, so That's a very good question. Like the medieval, medieval, medieval yeah. <laughs> right. Another, sorry. Please, again, no, please. Um, I, this could be totally wrong, but like after the Spanish enslavement of the natives and like after all this process where like, they were free and all that, is there any sort of like forced cultural assimilation that it could be parallel to like the forced cultural assimilation of Native Americans in North America? Is there anything like that? Well, well, there are a couple of um, differences. So native slavery was never officially allowed in Latin America. So Isabella comes out, I believe, in 1503, 1502 or 1503, very early on to outlaw indigenous slavery. So it was instead called encomienda. It was sort of associating native labor to a particular Spaniard with the exchange of Christianizing that Spaniard and letting them have time off to go to mass and all the sacraments on holy days and things. Didn't always work out that way, so it was sort of unofficially kind of like slavery, but it was never officially slavery. Um, and that ends, um, the new laws of 1542 kind of <coughs> put an end to the uh, hereditary nature of the encomienda, and so within a couple of generations that is phased out. Um, but we don't really see a parallel, I don't think, to North American Native peoples, because in Mexico, the Spaniards blended in Whereas in the Americas, we pushed them all west or pushed them into reservations and didn't really want to associate with them by mixing in the same way. So um, not to say one was better than the other, but it was just a different process of Spaniards living with and intermarrying with the native populations. One final question, please. I guess, I guess this might be a, a larger question about global history. Uh, I'm curious about how you guys see it moving uh, a, in terms of, in relation to, uh, like, gender, it's wonderful to mm -hmm. have a panel, first and foremost, of entirely female scholars, so <laughs> thank you very much. Um, and then also in terms of, like, the conversation between, um, like, a lot of this is happening with people who are still coming to the West and are trained in the West, yes. and then how that, that dialogue with people who are, like, indigenous church historians or religious <coughs> historians uh, in other contexts. Uh, so, I don't know, like, it's kind of like two tandem things, and I'm curious about how you guys mm -hmm. prepare prognosticate for us <laughs> about how things might, might shift. Well, I think there's a movement in um, the study of Latin American Christianities to focus on indigenous Christianities and the manner in which Native peoples have um, sort of contributed to the development and the very active ways that they're involved. And um, I've been asked, I'm sort of completing a book chapter for um, a book that sort of talk. it's called Decolonial Christianities, and it's all about the way that Native peoples have not just resisted, but offered sort of a counterpoint that it's not just passive native peoples who are being f 
coerced into Christianity, but actually many of them are take, take an active role in, in sort of developing their own understanding of Christianity means to them. Uh, and, and so there's, I think that's in a really exciting movement to take it away from simply um, implementing Christianity or simply Native peoples um, do, giving to the Christian side, but, um, but way that Native peoples help to develop a new kind of Christianity. So that's the direction that I think my field is taking uh, to, to sort of recognize the complexities that it's not just sort of one way or the other. It's, there's a lot involved in the process of developing Christianities in these different, different cultures. Mm-hmm. Like third culture Christianity. Mm-hmm. And, and I suppose. By, and by the way, Inquisition records are great about that because the, uh, the, they often go into what people are doing kind of in the villages, however mm-hmm. you interpret it. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, cool. So do, do, you, do you want to uh, uh, take that up? I can look. Sorry? I'm going to defer to someone who knows more about the field than, <laughs> than I do. Oh, this is a, a topic that came up at the American Society of Church Street Council meeting yeah. just last January. We, the society wants to be more globally engaged, but with without infinite resources, trying to figure right. out does it make the most sense to try to fund international scholars to come to our conference? Mm. Does it make the most sense to try to partner with international um institutions and have some of our conferences there? Do we want to put our resources sure. towards translation mm-hmm. of scholarly work that otherwise wouldn't come, because we mm-hmm. Americanists never learn any other languages, so <laughs> totally lame like that. Um, how would that work? So it, it's it's logistically really challenging. Um, and, and then at what point are you still the American Society of Church History? What does that even mean? Mm. Is it our job to be global, or is it somebody else's job? Um, I don't know. It's, it's tough. We are, we're aware of it, but we, we're not sure how to pull it off. Yeah, and if I can actually um, add to that, Alicia. One of the things that I noticed, I have a half-written post out there where I'm trying to figure out why women are still so, I mean, it's, it's when you look at textbooks about church history, um, I mean, women, they are not at the level that they should be in, in the newest ones. I mean, they're, they're so absent from, from church history textbooks. And so I've been trying to figure out why. And one of the things, if you actually go through, and I've, I have a nice spreadsheet going, um, <laughs> which has <laughs> most so. of the textbooks, you know, they're, they're mostly written by Western men. <laughs> um, and they're mostly following a narrative that was laid out for us in the early 20th century. And so it seems to me that if we could do something where we get scholars um, we're translating, getting scholarship for, that foreign scholars have brought in and getting that actually translated and published by wider publishing houses. I mean, I think that's a large part of the problem is that this scholarship's not getting published and it's not getting the attention that uh, one's produced by sort of our, our go-to people that we know will sell a whole lot of copies. And so they're the same people writing the same stuff and we're not changing the narrative. So I think publishing is a big part of maybe changing and the narrative. That's very similar to, mm-hmm. um, so last, not this last one, but the year before, um, I sort of chaired a roundtable on global histories and the Reformation, because mm-hmm. it was 2017. <laughs> and, and we had Dana Robert, Mark Knoll, and Mary Wiesner Hanks mm-hmm. sort of talking about that and and if you've heard Mary Wiesner's name before she's sort of the person for world history currently in the United States but she does a survey of world history textbooks of which she's written the best seller of that mm-hmm. group and one of the things that she talked about was that this is a pl- this is a win and a loss in, in this sort of globalization of history, the win is that we're looking at places beyond just Western mm-hmm. Europe. The loss is that we have kind of reverted to a 19th century great man. Yes. That, that mm-hmm. because you're trying to hit stuff There's so someone. quick yeah, yeah. When, uh, on the Reformation, the Reformation becomes Martin Luther, John Calvin, right. move along. Right. Yep. right? Mm-hmm. And, and so she was saying sort of, because she's got these two spheres of her career, the Reformation gender person, mm. and then the world global history person, she said, you know, they, they come, they right. come at each so other cool. in a way that she wants more women, but you get a thousand or 
four thousand words to cover the Reformation. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mention, um, in case all of you weren't aware, but Notre Dame has a global religion. The Global Religion Research Institute is, has um, funding for international collaborations if you focus on contemporary religion, and they're on their third year of funding. Uh, mm -hmm. So, if you want to, if you wanted to put something together with someone who's in another country, you can get, I think, up to twenty-five thousand dollars for travel mm -hmm. and collaboration. Um, I just got a curriculum development grant from them um, for the second year, and there, there's one more year in the in the series of funding. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's uh, okay with everyone, I think I need to go to, uh, to uh, an end here. Um, thank you very much.